Session. Session is going to be about uh, the Patton family involvement with the Bill Bay Sea Point Lawrence and around the East Coast here. And uh, I'm just going to speak on our relation uh, to this area. And of course, uh, that also includes my, uh, my brother, Bob Patton, who you, uh, many of you probably know, uh, Brother Bob Patton and his uh, uh, very attractive wife, Dorothy. And he lives next door to me. And we live, we live on the beach down at Joe Bay, uh, down the hill from uh, Thurman Bond, Joe Bond's old house, down the Bond Mill Road. And uh, we live down there, and we love it. And uh, anyway, this all commenced in uh, 1907. In, nine, uh, in 1907, my grandfather, Harry W. Patton, for whom I am named, was uh, managing editor of the Bellingham Daily Paper, which was the Reveille in those days, the Reveille. And he was managing editor, and he was a well-known journalist who had served uh, Owen Los Angeles on the paper, and he'd been uh, in the uh, Spanish-American War down in Cuba, and uh, he eventually came to Bellingham and was managing editor. He was a good one, too. And in 1907, he decided to um, rent a boat and head west and examine the San Juan Islands, or peruse them, as I like to say, and see uh, what's out here. So he headed out and he crashed into Lummi and took one look at that big mountain and said, that's not for me. So he went around the south end and picked up 270 and he ended up on uh, what is now uh, my beach. He stepped out of his boat and he took a big oar and he jammed it into the sand and he said, I claim this land in the name of Isabella. <laughs> Out from the fir trees stepped a man and said, Who the hell is Isabella? <laughs> Turned out to be a gent by the name of uh, Robert Patanouster, who had been the homesteader, who was the homesteader of our property. And had been here for years and years and years. Uh, the Homestead Act was... Uh, uh, created in 1862 and it meant that uh, anyone who wished to come west and claim land from the government could eventually own it if they did the following. If they lived on the land for five years, if they uh, grew certain things or raised animals on the land, if they built a house. And so uh, they had to stake out an area and file it with the proper authorities and then stay for five years. Well, uh, Robert Paternoster did that down on our property. And um, in, uh, let's see, I think it was uh, what, 18, uh, 1861 or so, 1891 maybe, uh, uh, he finally uh, was granted by Benjamin uh, Franklin uh, the property that we now own. Uh, at that time, it was 36 acres and 2,000 feet of waterfront. Hooray! Beautiful. And anyway, uh, he had grown, uh, uh, so he had a small orchard and he had also uh, grown some sheep and things like that. But he decided in 1907 to go ahead and sell it. So he turned to uh, uh, my grandpa and he said, how would you like to buy it? He said, I'd like to sell it. And he said, uh, being stuck here in uh, this side of the island, there are no women, women available. 
And so I never did get married. I'd like to find out what women are like, and I'd like to get married. I want to go to a place called Bellingham. And so uh, 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 Grandpa said, uh, well, uh, how much? And he said, well, I'm going to have to charge you uh, $700 for 2,000 feet of waterfront. And so Grandpa, uh, who really didn't have much money in those days, uh, decided to go ahead. And so he bought the property. Took him a long time to pay for it. So anyway, Mr. Paternoster headed for Bellingham and found a wife. And uh, uh, on the property was the home that he'd been required to build. And it was right on the bluff, right above the shore. And our shore is uh, for, uh, <laughs> to, uh, for that uh, entire distance was uh, bedrock, except for uh, a 90 foot little wonderful gravel beach, which is where I live now. So anyway, uh, in the summers, uh, Grandpa and his uh, wife and uh, his one son, my father, Joe, and the three daughters uh, would come over to Orcas Island to spend a certain amount of time here on the island on our property. Now, fortunately, a uh, dock had been built in, uh, let's see, uh, 1904 uh, down at where the Dove store is. That's the end of the county road. There's a little county road that runs down. Used to be a dock there. Used to be two docks. The first one uh, blew down years ago, uh, later uh, due to extreme storms. And in 1910, the county finally came up with a few bucks and built a county dock there, uh, very similar to the one at Alga. So we actually had our own dock there. So uh, Grandpa and his uh, uh, family could come over and uh, on the little steamers that would come out, the little mosquito boat steamers, and they'd stop at the dock but uh, the only way up to our house, which is uh, uh, about a mile north along the water from Doe Bay, was, was a trail. Uh, there were no roads to where, we, where this cabin was. So uh, Grandpa and the family had to carry all of their sleeping bags, their food, and uh, everything else up to this house that Mr. Paternoster had left. And they would stay there uh, uh, for their time in the summer for vacation. Now, also, um, the little uh, boats started to run. Uh, the ferry boats didn't start to come to Orcas Island until 1922 uh, to the dock down uh, uh, at Orcas, where it comes now. Uh, 1922. So uh, a, a group of or, uh, people decided, well, let's uh, buy some small 60-foot, 50-foot gas-driven steam-powered boats to run from Bellingham out uh, to the islands, uh, clear out to Friday Harbor. And so these little boats used to run from uh, Bellingham. They used to leave uh, about 6.30 in the morning and head west and the first island was Sinclair, which is right in front of me, uh, a little town called Urban uh, on Sinclair. And not too many people lived there. <laughs> it was uh, not well populated. And then it would stop at Doe Bay and they would let passengers and uh, uh, produce and their, uh, things off and then proceed on to Alga and East Sound and ending up in Friday Harbor. And then they would turn around in the afternoon and retrace where uh, they had come over in the morning. So that was the Mosquito Fleet, which ran. The last one was the Osage, 
Uh, some of you may remember the Osage. I do, and I, my brother and I have ridden on that boat uh, up until 1950, uh, when uh, it uh, no longer ran. So there, there were these little boats that ran back and forth and uh, brought things to uh, Doe Bay and the Doe Bay store. And the Doe Bay, uh, uh, Doe Bay uh, was uh, settled uh, uh, by a gent, uh, one of the many gents, uh, Mr. Brary. Uh, was very, very prominent in the area. He had the biggest piece of property, which uh, encompassed Doe Bay. And uh, so <laughs> he became the postmaster, but his house was the post office, and also uh, uh, was uh, up until uh, about, uh, see, 1904, I think it was, uh, uh, the store. Uh, the grocery store in his own private house. Long, I think it was 1904 or 5, uh, the Dobe store that you can see today, many of you have, uh, it's been rebuilt, uh, was built at that time. And uh, we, uh, we uh, the post office was transferred to the store. And uh, I can still see Harry Reid down there with his great big old cancellation stamp. The mail did not have to go like it does today to Everett and be sent around the United States, but uh, Harry Reid had this beautiful land and people started to uh, buy property here and move around all through uh, mainly the Dobe area and of course Alga, which was uh, also a, a big uh, place, and so uh, more and more people came to uh, our island and to the Dobe area. The, uh, the as I said, the, the ferry boats. Uh, the first one was 1922 to Arcus, but then. Um, <laughs> As the notes say, uh, people in this area, uh, uh, the road from here to Orcas was a one-laner dirt job. And you can imagine what that was like. And even before that, uh, the mail was brought by horseback. Uh, when Beric lived in his house, the mail was brought by horseback and certain foods and things. So. Going to the ferry boat, even today, it takes me a half hour to get there if I'm going to obey the law and don't have uh, uh, Steve on my tail, you know, the deputy. And, uh, so they decided, the locals decided, well, let's really do something. Let's move ahead. Let's, uh, let's build our own fer uh, ferries out here. So they, uh, people got together and... Uh, started to build a few ferries. Uh, one of them uh, uh, was up on Carol Culver's property, which happens to be a tangent to the north of Sea Acres. Right in there was the uh, Culver property. Uh, the Point Lawrence uh, uh, turned into the Point Lawrence Resort. It's uh, right north of Sea Acres. Uh, the first ferry was there. Uh, on Culver's Beach, and they thought, hooray, uh, summertime, we've got our own ferry, and it would take them all the way to an island called Lummi, where you got off and then went and got on the other ferry and went to the mainland. And everybody was happy except uh, the winter storm came, and guess what? The dock was washed out and never built again. Now, I don't have dates when the other ferries were built uh, or installed, uh, but one was uh, down at Obstruction Pass, and uh, a couple were on the North Shore somewhere, along in there. But uh, they all kept being washed out, and so we, uh, they finally, it's the one down at Orcas, is the one that we have now. When the engines on the boats keep running, 
And that's one thing, and you've got to be, you have to be adapted to Orcas Island uh, and adaptable uh, because if the fairies go out, you just uh, have to go with the doggone flow. And uh, that's the way it is, and most of us don't really care. I mean, if they do. And I remember about, oh, I don't know when it was, uh, six, eight, nine, ten years ago when uh, they popped it in reverse and it didn't work and they tore the dock out uh, there at uh, Orcas. Do some of you remember that? And it was out for five days. And uh, uh, there was screaming and shouting, except for the, a lot of the people on Orcas. We had uh, our food, uh, you know, and we had everything. And, and to heck with the uh, Californians who were all here. And it turned out that there were, I think they found uh, 50 uh, Hertz cars <laughs> marooned on the island <laughs> that, that couldn't get off. As I recall, it took them, uh, well, uh, they started being taken off. Uh, the, uh, the operators of these um, uh, little uh, uh, barge boats, uh, honey, what's the one that comes to your place there? San Juan Enterprises, there's uh, uh, Henry Island. Now. Henry Island and the San Juan uh, uh, Islander uh, that come down to where she lives, you know. Uh, those people really figured we've got it made, we've got the Californians captured. <laughs> so they, they started charging a lot of dough, and I think they could put about five or six cars on and they started charging people to take their cars back. And of course the Californians all screamed at the sheriff and said, we've got to get off, we have, I have an air appointment, i got to get out, I have an air appointment. You know, like they do. But uh, 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 the airlines were busy as heck trying to, put, they could only put about six people in the airplane, so it took a while. But these cars all ended up all over the island. I remember seeing them. And I had a good time, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the people on the island, when that happens, the people have uh, uh, two rules on the island as soon as the dock is smashed. Uh, rule one is to race to the uh, uh, grocery store and buy your groceries, because we're not going to get any. And rule two is drive immediately over to the liquor store. <laughs> And buy your Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, the grocers used their heads and they uh, uh, got those great big grocery trucks to be put on those uh, barges and brought over. So I think that within about the second day, we started to get food here on the island. And it actually was a, it was a good deal. And nobody really cared except the poor Californians. Uh, with the coming of the Mosquito Fleet and the ferry boats, uh, the resorts started to develop. Uh, many, many people started to come over to Orcas. They heard about the fishing. At one time, there were an awful lot of fish here around the island. And so they started to come. And several resorts, uh, well, actually, I think we ended up with 14 of them. But the ones that I'm familiar with are on our side of the island. One was uh, Doe Bay Twin Cedars Resort. And uh, uh, the other, uh, another one was uh, Sea Acres, run by Jess and Jesse White down there. And uh, north of them was uh, Carol Culver. A lot of you people remember Carol Culver, a real interesting person somewhat wild, but interesting. And he had the uh, uh, Point Lawrence Lodge. And so people started to come. And also, uh, the, there were many, many fish between about 1938 and 1952 on our side of the island. In 52, the fish all went to the other side of the island and they haven't been back since. <laughs> 
but uh, the resort business was great. Uh, oh, Jess and Jesse were making all kinds of money. Uh, they all, the resort owners uh, got a bunch of uh, 16-foot boats out, you know, and uh, you could catch a salmon in about, if you knew the right spot, uh, in about 20 minutes. Uh, the most prominent spot on our side was dear old Point Lawrence, where the east-west uh, current used to come across the north, and the south uh, current from the south would come up and would meet at Point Lawrence and force and burble up and force all the salmon up. And so uh, uh, I remember after uh, like 1946 when I got back from the service, uh, any uh, day you could look up at Point Lawrence and see 16 or so boats out there catching their limit of salmon. It was absolutely wonderful. And uh, also, if you wanted uh, ling cod, which I love and are easier to catch, uh, I could just catch one about 50 feet off of my beach. We just push the boat out 50 feet and get a ling cod. Uh, we would get salmon too, but uh, no one had invented the uh, downrigger. Edward Downrigger had never invented his downrigger. So we were trolling. You put a, a bait on the uh, line and troll, and that was fine except that uh, there is a uh, home of seals uh, on the Peapod Rocks right off of uh, where I live. And the Seals were clever enough, I never, we never could figure it out, they would swim alongside of, a, of, of our bait at about three knots and take the uh, herring off without getting the uh, hook. And so you, you never won. So I finally gave up and uh, 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 let other people fish or else I'd go down to the market and buy fish. <laughs> But uh, anyway, um, the resorts did very, very well, and it was a lot of fun. And as Dave Duran was mentioning there uh, a little while ago, uh, everybody pitched in at the resort, especially Sea Acres. I'm more familiar with Sea Acres because I knew Jess and Jesse real well. But uh, uh, we used to have... Uh, uh, Dance, uh, Saturday nights were fun, you know, in the old days. People don't do it now. Uh, the old Saturday nights, uh, families, neighbors used to get together down on the beach. They would build great big fires and sing and have a huge potluck. And uh, down there at Doe Bay, there was this uh, a boathouse. And... Uh, uh, they would pull the uh, rest of the boats out of the boathouse, and uh, we had a, uh, just had a Victrola, because there, there was no electricity in the boathouse, so we had a hand-driven Victrola. Some of you may know what that is, and maybe you don't, but uh, it, plays, uh, it plays records. And uh, then we had a collar for a square dance, and uh, we would have some cook, and I happen to know him, but he's long gone. Uh, he, uh, he used to drink a lot. And so Jess and Jesse would give him a bunch of dough and say, you go into Seattle and get all the food for the next couple of weeks and uh, bring him back. And guess what? Uh, he wouldn't show up for three or four days. So there were Jess and Jesse trying to run this restaurant by themselves. So they would, uh, Jesse would pick up the phone and would call my, uh, my mother and my wife and say, hey, we're in deep trouble, can you give us a hand? And, and she'd call others and pretty soon a bunch of the women would go down and help her cook the lunches and dinners. And it used to be, that's the way people used to work. We used to work together for an endeavor. And that was really fun. Uh, now we're going to move to, uh, finally, 
to uh, the prohibition ro rum running era. And uh, the, uh, the uh, 18th Amendment, uh, uh, which was, went into effect uh, in 1920, was the uh, Prohibition Amendment, uh, which meant that no one could manufacture uh, booze or sell or drink uh, whiskey in the United States. And uh, uh, quite a few people were unhappy with this situation, mainly the men. The, w the women were happy with it because uh, at that moment in time, uh, uh, the man used to get uh, his paycheck on Friday and stop by the local grog shop on the way home. And when he got home, there wasn't enough food that next week for uh, food and uh, wasn't enough money for food and clothing. And then rightfully so, the WCTU, Women's, Christ Women's Christian Temperance Union, and others uh, uh, helped uh, get this uh, act uh, uh, this law enacted, and that was that was fine. Except uh, the men were a little unhappy. So how do you solve it? You start uh, moving whiskey from Canada across the border down into the United States, and uh, that was pretty darn easy to do for a while because the border is about three thousand miles long, and there weren't that there weren't uh, sufficient uh, border guards. Or customs people to uh, prevent this and so through the trees uh, the uh, whiskey got moved down but they began getting caught so some entrepreneurs uh, here on the West Coast decided why don't we get a bunch of boats and we'll uh, load them up in uh, Vancouver and we'll run them south down through the San Juans to Seattle Great idea, we'll do it at night, no one will see us. And so they did. And the uh, head uh, 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 man in charge was a fellow by the name of uh, Ray Olmsted. And he was the head rum runner on the West Coast here. And he uh, uh, hired people and boats to move the whiskey down uh, to Seattle. And so uh, the votes that he started with were not too fast. In those days, uh, outboard motors didn't have much horsepower. Inboards weren't too uh, uh, sufficient. Uh, they didn't have enough torque or force. So they needed bigger boats and they needed bigger motors. And also, uh, they uh, the rum runners began getting caught uh, by heading south. The uh, reveners used to uh, uh, search through Patos Island and uh, the North Islands there, and uh, uh, they, they knew pretty well where they were going. So uh, they would hang out on those. There's two uh, uh, inlets on Patos. Uh, one in the left is one in the west is. The best one, been there many times, and then there's a tiny one on the, I think it's called the Toe Inlet on the right-hand side of Pedro's Island, and that's a great spot to hide. But the uh, 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 Olmstead's boats weren't that fast, so he said we've got to do something to really, uh, we have to get bigger boats and faster boats. So how do we do it? And he happened to know. Uh, a gent by the name of uh, uh, N.J. Blanchard, Norm Blanchard, uh, who had a boat yard at the north end of Lake Union. Uh, probably none of you know or are familiar with that at all. <laughs> you got a Blanchard? Yeah. Uh, he did well, uh, uh, both before the prohibition and after. He did real well. I knew him real well. Well, he was my dad's friend. N.J. Blanchard was my father Joe's friend, and he had a great uh, boat yard there, and he built outstanding boats uh, for many, many, many years. But uh, during the pro during uh, the Depression, uh, there was no money, 
so people weren't buying boats. And that also was uh, coincidental with uh, the uh, Prohibition time. So NJ wasn't uh, <coughs> building any, any boats. But uh, Olmsted said, hey, we will uh, uh, we'll buy some boats from you. We need some about 22 feet long, high chine, uh, bass boats. Would you build them for us? And N.J., of course, <laughs> said yes. And so, uh, uh, but uh, the deal was that uh, N.J. Blanchard would, would not be called a rum runner because he only built the boats. And no one could be arrested for building any boats for no matter what purpose. Uh, the only way uh, a person, a rum runner, could be uh, apprehended would be uh, when he was caught with a boatload full of whiskey. So you could build all the boats you wanted. And uh, actually, uh, uh, I, uh, I knew N.J. and I knew his son, and uh, uh, they, uh, they built uh, many boats, but, and it was all legal for them to build the boats, and he said many times the, uh, uh, the revenuers would come in, but they couldn't touch the boats because their, the boats hadn't been built yet and weren't being used. Now the boats needed some high-speed engines. They needed some uh, bigger engines with bigger screws and more torque. Uh, who can we, where can we possibly find the engines? And so N.J. said, I happen to know a gent who owns the Seattle Marine Equipment Company on Marion Street. His name is Joe Patton. That was my father. <laughs> Here we go into the rum running business. So N.J. got hold of Dad and uh, explained the situation. He said, you boats are no good without the motors. Uh, would you know where we can get them? And Dad said, well, there's none on the this coast, but let me check around. Well, my dad was quite an operator, and he came up with quite a few high-speed engines on the East Coast, and they magically got out here, courtesy of my father. But it was legal because they were not rum running, uh, being used. And so uh, dad's engines went into uh, N.J. Blanchard's boats, and the boats went to Olmsted, and he started hauling the boots. And N.J. and my dad got paid. <laughs> this is where our money came from during the Depression. Not much, but a lot. So you say, uh, well, uh, was your dad a rum runner? And the answer is no, he wasn't, because dad never ever operated the boats uh, and uh, never hauled any of the whiskey. And so he was not a rum runner, so I'm off the hook, but he was a facilitator. He was a facilitator, and that worked out fine. So that, uh, uh, that was that thing. But then uh, also we have to get into how uh, that becomes involved with Doe Bay and my property. Uh, the rum runners, Olmsted and Company, had been apprehended uh, uh, in Patos and the other uh, the other uh, islands right north of uh, Orcs here. And so, uh, one uh, uh, the the reason I have this information is that I actually did know Bill Boyer, who ran the Doe Base store way back during that time. Uh, he'd uh, purchased it from uh, Mr. Townen, who was one of the first owners of the Doe Bay store. Mr. Townen uh, drowned in an accident uh, in Cascade Lake when he fell out of the boat. And uh, uh, his wife married Bill Boyer, and they ran the store. And uh, uh, I'd met him. Uh, several times when uh, Dad and I would come north 
uh, to check on the property here when I was, uh, oh, uh, 13, 14 years old, or even less than that, we would come north. And uh, Bill Boyer would be telling these stories to my dad about what happened. And he said, uh, this is all, uh, I, I wrote this all up in a document, which is on file here, if anybody ever wants to really know the uh, technical situations about our involvement with the rum running, it's on file and can be drawn <laughs> here. <laughs> if you care to know exactly, well, the dates, I, I wrote it mainly for my kids in the future. These things become forgotten soon, so I love to, I do a lot of technical writing and uh, our property uh, had been purchased in 1907, as stated, but it had been blank, uh, left uh, vacant between 1911 and uh, about uh, 1936. Our property was blank, just that old house on it, uh, due to the fact that uh, my granddad had been offered a better job as managing editor of the Hopium Daily Paper. So Grandpa and his uh, wife moved down to Hopium in 1911, and uh, uh, my dad and his three sisters were just ready. They are probably 18, 19, so they were eligible to go to the University of Washington, so they all went to the UW. So nobody came up here from, you know, between uh, uh, 1911 and about 1936. So anyway, uh, Bill Boyer's talking to my dad, and he says, well, this one day, uh, uh, a 20-footer, uh, a black 20-footer came into my dock and uh, came up to the Dobe store, and uh, uh, he said, uh, Bill said, as soon as I saw the boat, he said, uh, I pretty well knew what it was for by its design. It was kind of a high-speed thing, painted black. And uh, uh, this uh, fellow by the name of Roy Olmsted got out and uh, started talking to me and become friendly and uh, uh, asking a bunch of questions to see how things are going. And finally he knew that uh, 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 he could trust me, so he said, you know, he says, um, uh, we've got something we'd we, we really like to do, and we need your opinion as to whether we should or not, or whether we can get away with it. Uh, there's a uh, hidden beach about a mile north of the Dobe store here, your store, where uh, we've occasionally been, we've stopped to uh, hide our boats before we head south. And he says, also the procedure is we bring a bigger boat out and unload a whole load of uh, whiskey on this beach north of you and then head out. And if we uh, get caught going back to Bellingham, to uh, Vancouver, uh, there's no uh, whiskey on the boat. We're okay and they let us go. And then the next couple of nights, on the dark of nights, we bring the high speed uh, uh, 19 footers down or 20 footers and uh, load up the whiskey and race down to Seattle and unload uh, uh, around Everett where there weren't too many houses. And he said, uh, we'd like to use this hidden beach because it's perfect. It's got uh, bedrock uh, jutting out uh, on the north and south sides and the beach is hidden. Uh, do you know who owns the beach? <laughs> Uh, Bill Boyer says, yeah, that's uh, Joe Patton's property. It happened to be my beach. <laughs> and so he said, well, uh, does Joe ever come up? And, and Bill says, no, he, he never comes up. He's busy down Seattle. And he never comes up. And uh, 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 Olmstead, well, do you think he would know about this? And uh, Bill said, no, uh, I don't think he would know about that. And so uh, uh, Olmsted said, well, uh, do you think we could just go ahead and keep using this? Uh, we will make it worth your while. <laughs> well, when a rum runner tells you to make it worth your while, you can pretty well figure what's coming. <laughs> so uh, Bill said, well, yeah, uh, uh, I don't think Joe would mind. <laughs> he doesn't care. He's not here. And I don't mind, no, there's nobody lives around here, so help yourself. And so Homestead said to uh, Bill, 
He says, okay, great. And, uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave you a few samples, <laughs> quite a few samples. And he, and he said, now, if uh, the rum runners, uh, if you see rum runners coming in or in a car, uh, if you will let us, or if you'll let us know, we will well make it worth your while. And so Bill said yes. And so, anyway, a month later, he's, uh, he's talking to my dad, telling him the story, and I'm standing there at age 14, <laughs> listening. I don't even know what a rum runner is at age 14. I didn't know what prohibition was, and I didn't know what the Great Depression was, even though we're eating beans. So, uh, uh, one day, uh, uh, he, uh, Bill's telling my dad, uh, a big black uh, limousine uh, drove up to my store and two men in black suits got out and came in and said that they were with the government and did he know where the patent property was. And uh, Bill said, well, uh, I told him I was just fairly new here. I didn't know. I, I didn't really know where the patent property was. And he said, uh, 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 but uh, I, I heard that it's back toward Olga. We, all, we always blame Olga. It's back toward Olga. So uh, the uh, two uh, revenuers got in the car and headed back toward Olga. And uh, Bill Boyer went down on his beach and jumped in his little uh, ro uh, this little boat. And he had a, uh, uh, the only motor he had was, in those days, was a five and a half horsepower Evinru. In those days, that's what we had, a five and a half horse. And he said, I headed, I headed north uh, through the kelp, trying to work my way through the kelp. And he said, I finally arrived at the at your beach. And he said, pulled up high was one of the boats. And uh, two men jumped up and grabbed their guns and pointed at me. And one of them said, it's OK, Ed. It's Bill Boyer. So they put the guns down. So I warned them about what was happening. And so they quickly uh, loaded their boats up with all the whiskey they could load and they put a case of whiskey in my boat. I don't know why, but they did. <laughs> and they headed out never to be seen before again, and I came home. So uh, that is the tale of uh, <laughs> my father being involved in rum running. We, uh, he was a facilitator, and uh, this helped me out because you've all heard of uh, other uh, men who've been afraid to research their forebears, their grandfathers, for fear of hearing that your grandfather's been shot for stealing a horse. <laughs> and I thought that maybe my uh, grandfather or her father would be involved. But that's the story of the rum running. Let's see. Okay, um, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, produce uh, on Orcas Island, uh, which uh, many of you probably know about, that, that years and years ago around uh, East Sound were many, many apple trees and uh, Italian palm trees down there. In fact, at one time, 